Hello, good afternoon. My name is Susan Oxby. I'd like to welcome you to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive for In Focus, Sergei Eisenstein and his contemporaries. Of course, this is a 14 week long lecture screening series led by Anne Nesbitt of the Slavic and Film and Media Departments here at UC Berkeley. And we're really, really grateful to you for, for doing this, for partnering with MPFA and students in the, her Eisenstein uh, course on campus are part of our audience, and it's really a pleasure to be able to show the works that are in the series that you're, you're leading and to also have a chance to see the films on the big screen and for the students to have that chance too. It's wonderful. And then I also thank you so much because in the course of the past week, as I'm sure you are probably aware, um, Anne has been joined by Peter Bogrov, our our guest from Moscow, who's been in town for the last eight days and has presented multiple times, as we've also launched the Sergei Eisenstein retrospective that carries on until April 21st. It's been a very celebratory opening weekend, and we were joined by other scholars um, through the United States from Yale, Princeton, uh, University of Texas at Austin, and Reed College. And so I am especially grateful for Anne, who has guided us through this last week so, so well. And I did want to just thank the sponsors who've helped make all of this possible. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts help us with the In Focus series. So this Wednesday afternoon slot is part of that. And the NEA is also helping with us with a new series called Out of the Vault, which allows BAM PFA to work with scholars, such as the uh, scholars who came in for who are experts in early Russian and Soviet cinema, but to really examine prints from our own film archive. They're truly rare. And Peter has helped us identify some, some films that are in our collection. And Anne, of course, has been very familiar with these films over her period here at Berkeley. And it's a real pleasure to allow those films to get more attention. Um, as well to Peter, thank you for making this uh, trip, you're just a wealth of information about many topics not limited to Russian and Soviet cinema. So it's great always to have you in town. Peter was our guest a couple years ago with the Soviet Georgian and Georgian cinema series that we put together. And he, when he was working at Ghost Film Fund of Russia for four years, he really helped us uh, secure additional prints for that important series. Uh, currently, he's with the Moscow State Cinema Museum and also teaching in Moscow. So I also want to say a big thank you to Judith Rosenberg, who is a regular feature of all of our programs that highlight silent cinema and a true talent here in the Bay Area. Um, so those are my thanks, and passing this over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the special Valentine's Day edition of Eisenstein and Early Soviet Film, in which only dreadful things happen to people who kiss, uh, as you'll see. And I also want to add my gratitude to Susan's, for, uh, to Peter Bugroff, for being so amazing over this whole week and, and being entertaining, super intelligent, plus encyclopedic. Uh, we are very lucky because he's going to join me on the stage um, after the screening for another more dialectical than usual open discussion period. And he has lots and lots and lots and lots to say about New Babylon, I assure you. Uh, and thank you also to Judith Rosenberg, who's going to improvise her way through amazing cinematic circus tricks for the Kuleshov part of our program. Yes, the Out of the Vaults at Out of the Vaults on Friday. How many people were here or there then for that? Yay, OK, great. Don't worry, you're not going to see the same thing again. Now I'm going to show you the good half hour of uh, two Buldi two, the the, clown, the revolutionary clown film. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But the main feature on the menu today, and that's a joke about the film, as you will see, um, is New Babylon by Kozlov and Drogo. So it may seem surprising that uh, Soviet filmmakers commissioned to produce a film on the revolutionary history of the Paris Commune would turn to a 19th century novel about department stores, but in fact, one of Grigory Kosintsev's and Leonid Traubrek's chief sources for their 1929 New Babylon was Zola's Au Bonheur des Dames, which tells the story about the triumphant rise of the department store uh, 
uh, in 1860s Paris. Cousin Stephen and here we have a picture, first of all, of Cousin Stephen Traubert. We've been talking about young revolutionary filmmakers. So Eisenstein's not very old in the 20s. Um, Kuleshov is even younger than Eisenstein in the 20s. But Cousin Stephen Traubert put the guys to shame because they were born in the 20th century. And so um, you have to do the math and you'll see that they are very young in the 20s, as is the third hero of the day, uh, Shostakovich, born in 1906. Um, and here they are uh, making revolutionary manifestos when they're still basically teenagers or almost. They were famous for founding what they called the factory of the eccentric actor, or FIEX, factory being a wonderful, positive, great sort of thing. Uh, and therefore, you wanted acting to be thought of in factory terms because that meant it was labor like any other labor, plus cooler, because it could have machines uh, involved. And here is a picture of the department store, the Grand Magasin in Paris, that was the inspiration for Zola's uh, novel, uh, Le Bon Marché. And here, a picture of its interior, which you'll see Cousin Stephen Traubert echo in the film. So Cousin Stephen Traubert's film tells the story of a poor Parisian shop girl, Louise, whose ordinary life of sneaking bites of sandwich at the sales counter and fending off or not the advances of the store's rapacious owner is turned upside down by the disastrous end of the Franco-Prussian War. When the Parisian bourgeoisie decides that it fears its own working classes more than it fears the Prussians, Louise ends up on the barricades while her soldier lover, Jean, becomes a reluctant participant on the other side, is this going to end well, we ask. In Zola's novel, however, there's nothing overtly revolutionary unless you count the Nietzschean revolution of power and wealth over the little shopkeepers of the quartier. Okay? Because Zola wrote it in a frenzy of forced optimism as a kind of antidote to his previous gloomier work, such as Anna. He says in notes, um, as he, as he was working about it on the, on the novel. Thus a complete change of philosophy, he says. No more pessimism. In a word, to go with the century, to express the century, which is a century of effort and conquest, uh, to depict the joy of action and the pleasure of existence. Anything not able to fit into this scheme of happy conquest must be crushed, just as the merciless and joyous behemoth of the store he calls Au Bonheur des Dames, uh, translated in English as the Ladies' Paradise, General Happiness of Women, which is the Walmart of its day, and crushes all the little merchants in the quarter. He says about this, quote, I will show them ruined, led into bankruptcy, but I will not cry over them, au contraire, because I want to show the triumph of modern activity. They are no longer of their time, so much the worse for them. They are crushed by the Colossus. So one could find this sort of uh, sentiment in Soviet Russia in the 20s, of course. But then the triumph of modern activity would have to be revolutionary and not capitalist triumph. And the revolutionary, not mercantile Colossus, would be presumably crushing with particular zeal those joyous capitalists who are the stars of Zola's department store universe. In short, the Zola novel, novel borrowed by Cousins of Traubert as the foundation for their film was, on the face of it, completely unsuitable, perhaps the least suitable of all of Zola's novels for revolutionary appropriation. But Zola happened to be a hot property in the Soviet times. As early as 1919, Zola was singled out as a writer whose aesthetic visions um, were per especially compatible with Soviet most of Zola's earlier works could safely be considered critiques of, rather than odes to, uh, capitalist society. What's more, the year Cousins of Traubert received the commission to make their film about the Paris Commune, 1927, marked the 25th anniversary of Zola's death. And Zola was receiving, in consequence, an enormous amount of positive critical attention, culminating in the production starting in 1928 of the first complete edition, Russian edition of his work. When the creative and iconoclastic minds 
of Cousins of Entrauberg took Zola's department store novel set in the 1860s, pushed the action up a few years to 1870 and 71, the year of the Paris Commune, added large doses of Marx, who after all had written um, a, another source for this no, uh, film, The Civil War in France, uh, written in 1871, um, when they put in references to Eisenstein and D.W. Griffith and yet more Zola, all the while pulling out the experimental stops in an attempt to reinvent montage and remake cinematic space-time, the net result was, as you're going to see today, a very strange film. One in which barricades and sales counters are, as it were, all mixed up. A film that makes us ask again and again the important question, what are they selling? Okay, so one answer to that question is easy. Parasols. The film uh, New Babylon and the store New Babylon share an obsession with parasols that comes, for one thing, right out of Zola's novel, which describes a big store display thus. Here's a little quote from Zola. It was the exhibition of parasols, wide open, rounded off like shields. They covered the whole hall from the glazed roof to the varnished oak moldings below. They described festoons around the semicircular arches of the upper stories. They descended in garlands along the slender columns. They ran along in close lines on the balustrades of the galleries and the staircases and everywhere ranged symmetrically speckling the walls with red, green, and yellow. They looked like great Venetian lanterns lighted up for some colossal in the corners were more complicated patterns, stars composed of parasols at 39 sous, the light shades of which, pale blue, cream white, and blush rose, seemed to burn with the sweetness of a nightlight. Whilst up above, immense Japanese parasols, on which golden-colored cranes soared in a purple sky, blazed forth with the reflections of a great confl conflagration. Madame Marty, so one of the consumers entering the store, endeavored to find a phrase to express her rapture, but could only exclaim, oh, it's like fairyland. As Marx might explain, the object, the parasol, is here made magical, phantasmagorical, and fairylandish by being divorced by the spectacular logic of the department store from its history, its origins, its use value, uh, and the labor that went into making it. In Kosenzef and Trauberg's new, new Babylon, the display of parasols is literally dazzling, a cinematic device employed to convey Marx's abstract description of capitalism's magic. With the collaboration of their adept cinematographer, Ms. King, the filmmakers use a dazzled mixture of light and shadow to convey the glitter of the commodity, the spell it casts by deceiving the eye of the spectator. The invisibility of labor in the world of this department store is a problem that New Babylon makes a kind of awkward attempt to tackle. Whether selling things counts as, as work is one of the questions the film raises in its first minutes in which the kind of human activity based on putting objects and oneself on display, the showgirl on the stage, the salesgirl at the counter, going cheap is the title that sets the tone, is contrasted by means of a short, interpolated montage sequence with the labor of haggard women sewing, men making shoes, women in some industrial laundry. Presumably this sort of work, which is not about spectacle, and which at least in the case of sewing and shoemaking actually makes things, um, is the antidote to the department store and the stage. The way the shots appear in the film, completely out of context, however, leaves the workers floating in some sort of otherworldly space and time, like the very commodities of capitalism that the workers' visual presence is meant to graft. When the commune is in power, we are shown these workers again, still isolated in their unplaceable frames. They're now smiling and happy. The only context for their smiling faces is the entirely abstract and textual one provided by the intertitles. Why are we so merry at our work? We work for ourselves and not the bosses, thus decrees the commune. Unconnected to the rest of the film or the rest of the production process, unconnected really to anything, the workers' merriness seems as entirely fantastic as their labor. The image of the parasol is itself a kind of commodity on display in this film. 
the origins are more complicated than I've suggested thus far. The glittering shot of Parasols in New Babylon also refers us to a pair of Soviet films in which Parasols and female class viciousness are paired. As tension builds in Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin, as we recently saw, an ambiguously bayonet-like point of a parasol approaches the camera in a shot that foreshadows in, a certain, in its implied violence the coming massacre. The lethal potential of the parasol is more fully established in Eisenstein's October 1928, a film that's still in our future, coming up in a couple weeks, but it's in New Babylon's past, um, and in which rabid bourgeois women use parasols to stab a revolutionary. This vicious image, Eisenstein admitted later, wasn't so much drawn from the actual history of 1917 as from images he had retained from tales of the Paris Commune. And what's more, he lists Zola's Aube Neuf des Dames as an influence on October. So you see Zola just keeps turning up. Well, even more so because Eisenstein then claims to be the one who converted his filmmaking peers, in particular, Kosenzoff and Trauberg, um, to an enthusiasm for Zola as they were making New Babylon. Another thing to keep your eye open for in this film, mannequins. The film's favorite prop is an, an inanimate clothes dummy a mannequin who serves as a kind of mute witness or shadow as the central character Louise makes her way from sales counter to barricade. At the frenzied sale with which the movie opens, the mannequin stands on display. When the store is ransacked to supply material for the barricades, the mannequin moves to the front lines. When the communards are destroyed, the mannequin, oh, well, that will be tough. You'll see. It's the mannequin's role to link barricade and sales counter together, a linkage that Louise hysterically recognizes and cements when she joins the burning mannequin, mannequin as the commune falls and begins waving linens about, um, woo, and says, going cheap, going cheap, in a replay of the sales scene from the beginning of the film. The visual irony here is so powerful that it trumps logic. Should the barricade really be another kind of sales counter? The mannequin's odd stance on the edge between things living and unliving on the barricade, as it were, between life and death, finds an echo in a particularly striking montage sequence in the middle of the film when somebody asks Jean the soldier, why are you so sad? Have you left someone behind you? There follows a quick montage of nine shots of Louise's head, a kind of series of snapshots taken as the head turns as if on a pivot the girl brought closer through montage to the mannequin. As it happens, the film's title, New Babylon, reflects the film's interest in history and cinema history as essentially layered things. That history comes in layers, anniversaries, repetitions, spirals, was a basic Soviet tenet. And a film about the Paris Commune, one commissioned at the time of the 10th anniversary of the October Revolution, was bound in any case to be inscribed into that pattern. A prior revolutionary attempt observed from the vantage point of the successful Soviet revolution. Such layering was most poignant and delicate in the cases in which the historical film described a failed revolution, which was of course the case not only for New Babylon, but for its famous Eisensteinian prede predecessors, Strike and Battleship Potemkin. New Babylon is the name Kozintsev and Trauberg give to the department store in which their doomed heroine, Louise Poirier, works. The name Nouvelle Babylon does not merely tie two famously decadent cities, Paris and Babylon, together in a, dis in a slightly disgraceful knot, um, but it also uh, suggests some other references that are even more complicated. The siege of Paris by those determined to crush the commune is implicitly compared to the successful siege of Babylon undertaken by Cyrus the Persian in 539 BC. Mediating this historical echo, what's more, is another important layer, this one film historical rather than simply historical, and that, of course, is D.W. Griffith's film Intolerance. Intolerance from 1916 
was a film that the early Soviet filmmakers studied with notorious zeal. A production epic in every respect, it's overtly constructed on the principle of historical layering. One story is set in modern times and tells the tale of a girl whose move into the city leads to all sorts of trouble. Uh, then the modern story is intercut with a number of other really dark tales, the Ugino massacre, the Christ story, and the episode most influential on Kozintsev and Trauberg's department store film, the story of the siege of Babylon. It's true that there's no department store per se at the heart of Griffith's Babylon, there is, however, a temple of love and laughter, a place where women dress up in, at most, filmy gowns and dance in honor of the goddess Ishtar until they are undone by the treachery of the male priest who delivers Babylon into the hands of Cyrus the Persian. Griffith's Babylonian temple thus resonates with Zola's Au Bonheur des Dames, which is also a temple devoted to women's pleasures and a cathedral in her fierce portrayal of Louise, the actress Yelena Kuzmina clearly seems to have been studying the work of her predecessors in Intolerance, Constance Talmadge, who plays the mountain girl in the Babylon section, and to a lesser degree, May Marsh in the mod modern story. Kuzmina adds her own flair, eccentric bravado, to the part, but the resonance between the mountain girl and Louise is unmistakable. As Kozintsev himself once said, quote, Eisenstein took lessons from Griffith in montage. We, on the other hand, learned from him about the art of acting. Montage does pay, play a very key role in this strange film. New Babylon's most striking stylistic device may be the way it takes what we might think of as the distilled essence of parallel montage to such extremes that the location of any scene, indeed, the relation in space and time between any of the film's characters or events becomes very difficult to pinpoint. As Miriam Tsukunas has commented, the actors seem to see and understand each other. They're presented to the spectators as if united in one and the same place. Nevertheless, since establishing shots are missing, nothing allows us to be certain that they're actually together. The montage glues faces and events together, but the spectator is not allowed to relax into a sort of single realistic story in which space and time behave properly. And that makes the big kiss, now promised twice, it's got to happen, uh, in this film especially important because that's a moment when layers and worlds collide and inhabit for a few shots a single Speaking of colliding layers, a word about the score for the film, composed particularly for it by Dmitry Shostakovich, who was even younger, as I said earlier, than the already very young cousins of Traubert. But he'd already written a symphony, um, and he had been making money playing improvised piano for silent films. He was sort of the Judith Rosenberg of his day. He was brought on board to write a score specifically for the film to be performed live with the movie. He watched the film once, says some account. Uh, he, he got a few notes written out about the timing and order of the scenes, and then off he went and in record time composed a score. And then, of course, it turned out that Kozintsev and Trauberg, in the two weeks before the premiere of the film, had decided that they would re-edit it, and they took out nearly a half an hour's worth of material. Okay, Shostakovich, young and strong, um, but at the time suffering from the flu and with other pressing deadlines on his docket, he had to re-edit the music at the last minute and at a gallop. And then of course, the orchestras couldn't quite master it and the music after a few performances fell into obscurity until after Shostakovich's death in the 70s when it was rediscovered, turned into a suite tinkered with, and then eventually started being put back together with the images, though of course that was an incredibly difficult process because there were various versions of the film in its visual uh, state, and none of them really quite seemed to match up perfectly with the scores that were emerge emerging from the vaults. It's amazing music. One thing it captures particularly well 
is the ironic layering that Kozintsev and Trauberg are doing visually. Shostakovich's music doesn't lie down obediently in service to a particular shot. Often it comments on it. There's a particularly famous and gruesome clash of the Marseillaise at one point with the famous can-can from Offenbach's uh, Orpheus in the Underworld. And then the sad song performed by the man sitting at the piano on the barricades uh, is in harmony with some images, images like the sad faces of those about to die, but also in conflict with battle scenes and cavalry racing that are also put into the montage. And that, friends and neighbors, is a very early instance of the sort of conflict that now has itself become a cliche um, in an era when every battle scene at the multiplex must be done in slow motion with very sad music. And just to um, end with a note about the thing that we're going to see first, which is about a half an hour's worth of Two Boldy Two, a film made by Kuleshov in 1929 and then um, butchered by Nina, a little bit, by Nina Agajanova Shutko, who was brought in to sort of rescue its political message. The theme that links this film about revolutionary clowns to New Babylon is the theme of a performance for a really hostile audience. So the fall of the commune in New Babylon is put on as a spectacle for a bourgeois audience that's sitting on the slopes at Versailles and watching through binoculars. Not that I think that that could actually technically work, at least not in my experience of sitting on the slopes of Versailles. Okay. Um, in Two Boldy Two, which is the name of the circus act that's supposed to go on a father clown and his son clown performing together for the first time, um, the father, who's a clown, must perform for a white army officer who says, amuse me and I won't execute your son. So we get the clown having to do a clown act to try to win this audience over to saving the life of his son. As you can imagine, that also doesn't go necessarily uh, so terribly well, but then there's another glorious sequence that also comes into our half hour um, in which the son saves himself through clever uses of every possible piece of circus apparatus in the tent and something that looks a little bit, as I promised on Friday, like the scene in Hitchcock's Murder, where you have um, a dramatic point of view um, sequence with a person on a trapeze in a moment of crisis. OK. So uh, what do I have to say here? I have to say a thank you to Judith for improvising the heck out of these clowns. And to all of us, uh, let's enjoy the very many layers of this show. First of all, our usual thing, uh, who hasn't seen this film before? Has not, has not, or has not. Great. So I just wanted to say, well, one rather extended thing. I thought it was a first, at first a crazy idea to unite those two films. And, you know, I liked it because they represent the two polar opposite tendencies in Soviet Films of 1929 is a turning point, the last year, I would say, of great silent masterpieces, a bit of 1930, in Russia and in the rest of the world, because 1930 is the beginning of the sound era. And so one thing was that uh, the directors, and including avant-garde directors, because the first one was done by uh, Lev Kulishov, who is considered the founding father of, the, of, of montage theories in the world, not only in, in Russia, uh, they knew how to apply this editing montage techniques to make a rather well, you know, conventional story, which could be a box office hit. You would see uh, wonderful angle shots and camera work and great editing. But of course, it's a film with a clear story with beautiful acting, because the main actor who plays uh, the father, Guldi, the clown, Sergei Komarov, is a great actor. It's impossible to play with such a crazy makeup, you know. And the other tendency was to make films like this, which did not have an individual hero, actually, because, um, you know, we all, when we talk about the films, we refer to them by their names. But that's what the actors wrote in their memoirs. So she is Louise Poirier, and he is Jean uh, Pelletier. But we do not have those names in the credits. In fact, they are a sales girl and a soldier. So they symbolize something. 
And initially they were planning to uh, make a film and started making a film with a more conventional story. And you could see who is who is whose girlfriend, who is whose father, who is whose sister, brother, right? And then they ended the, just by representing, you know, social social layers, right? And so of course this is a film which was highly influenced by Eisenstein and by Eisensteinian filmmaking. Um, uh, you see how the mothers work here. But, you know, FEX, uh, this uh, organization made by the directors, was a factor, as Anne said, factor of eccentric actor. So acting should have been the main thing here. And there isn't so much acting when uh, where the main characters are concerned. The girl acts wonderfully, but really who does the acting for her is the great cameraman André Mosquin. And we know his work for Ivan the Terrible. You know, he was the one who worked with Eisenstein later. Because she has a very difficult face for a cameraman, an impossible one. And usually what happens in Hollywood and in all the other countries is a good cameraman finds the best angle for such an actress and always use the same two or three main shots. Well, here he, and this was the famous, you know, bon mot of uh, the famous saying of Moskvin, he would turn a defect into an effect. So he would change the lighting and change the angle for every single shot of her. So she would, she would turn from this hungry sales girl to someone who is about to become the mistress of the of the manager, to a revolutionary, to a woman in love, you know, and, you know, she would really, uh, well, there would be a great development in, in this, right? But uh, what we have here, and, and lots of it, is great acting from the bit players. And this is what especially the Leningrad St. Petersburg School of Filmmaking was famous for. Uh, you would see very important people not only among actors but filmmakers uh, like in the store there are this um um a salesman with a monocle and with a little elephant that's Charlotte Podovkin the great director the director and then there was this very aggressive client who is buying uh, a parasol and pushing everyone with her elbows this is Pera Atashova a famous journalist Eisenstein's wife um there was this beautiful uh beautiful piece of acting at the barricades this girl right who is who just loses her boyfriend and she is, you know, um, we see all these changes of emotion in about a minute or so. She was a Ukrainian film star, Anna Zarzitska, who uh, dropped her career in Ukraine, moved to Leningrad because she loved so much working in such, well, a new style of filmmaking, right? So this is what, what they did here. And uh, mm, in spite of this being, you know, a film about the masses, there isn't a very clear narrative, I would say, plot. But in, about individuals, but it's also a film about people. And the human face was one of the most important things for in, in Leningrad. This is why they were really so keen on taking a very good actor for a part that lasts, you know, 40 seconds, two minutes, and working with him for several days to achieve this brilliant effect. And this is something which Eisenstein did not do. He would pick a perfect face, but then he would do the rest with editing. And they can try to combine those things. So, uh, and just one, one last thing, because, you know, after I, I watching it, I didn't watch it for many years on the big screen. I, there is, nevertheless, something, a very important theme, especially for this, one of the two directors, Grigory Kosinsev. Because, you know, this film, it starts at this nightmare, this gay Paris, famous one turns into a nightmare when everyone is, in fact, drunk, uh, 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 drunk, uh, drunk and prostitutes in a way, right? This crazy world of actors, prostitutes, um, diplomats, ministers at the same time. It begins like this and it ends like this. Uh, and the story doesn't make any sense for the main character, and as, but it does in the very middle. And this was, I would say, the main plot of all of his films, the main idea of all of Kosinsev's films, this short moment of freedom, and you can pay a price as high as your life for this. And this he did all his life, ending with his two main, most famous sound films, which were adaptations of Hamlet and King Lear back in the 60s and 70s. But it starts all the way from here. And also, I wanted to add that um, this, the way that they, they uh, synchronized Shostakovich to the images is actually different in this print. I hadn't seen this before um, than the ones that I have seen before. And you can see why it's difficult when you have somebody who's composing a score that is often an ironic counterpoint to the images, it's really hard to know how to fit it together. When is it ironic counterpoint and when is it just off, right? And we have a little, we have a bit of both, I think, in the way that they've solved the problem here. Yeah, and, and in fact, you're right, because I was, I remember clearly watching the film many times, and the very last piece of music which we have is another can, -can another counterpoint. So the whole story after this short m moment of freedom returns to the, to the nightmare, sort of fake 
artificial gaiety over the beginning of the film. Right, and there's a sort of Orientalist theme yeah, early on that's actually supposed to be um, poking fun at the parasols and the J and the Japanese fans and so on, and it comes here a little bit off, too. We're basically out of time. Do we want one symbolic question? Right, well, Zola's novel also has the girl in the department store being seduced by the head of the department store, except that in Zola's novel, um, she comes around to the side of the department store, even though it is destroying all of her family and all of the little, fa all, I mean, and crushing, really, literally. Some people just get crushed to death by uh, um, uh, all around her. So it, it takes this completely inappropriate story and it uses parts of it, and then it throws it into the Paris Commune and uh, changes the revolutionary character. Although it borrows also from other Zola novels that um, are more revolutionary in their vector. And is Susan giving us a stern eye? Do we have someone coming in right now? Hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry, and see you next week. Thank you, Peter Bagrov.